Welcome everyone uh, to the CHIP Landmark Ideas Series Seminar. Today, Michael Creamer, Professor in Economics at the University of Chicago and 2019 Nobel Laureate will be presenting along with his colleague, Dr. Brendan Tam. And the topic today is water quality and child survival. This is the CHIP Landmark Ideas Series and we have, um, uh, we will be, uh, uh, we're broadcasting here from the Computational Health Informatics Program, CHIP, founded in 1994. It's a multidisciplinary applied research program at Boston Children's Hospital. And the Landmark Idea Series is an event series led by CHIP that features thought leaders across healthcare, informatics, IT, science, and more. I'll be uh, moderating uh, the, the speakers today are Dr. Michael Creamer, um, again, a professor in economics at the University of Chicago, director of the Development Innovation Lab, 2019 Nobel Laureate, member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, fellow of the Econometric Society, and a member of the National Academy of Sciences. Dr. Creamer's recent research focuses on development economics, field experiments in education, health and water, and agriculture in developing countries. Brendan Joel Tan is an economist at the International Monetary Fund. His current work focuses on the policy response to the COVID-19 pandemic as part of the IMF's Global Health and Pandemic Response Task Force. His other research covers topics in health, trade, and development economics. I'm a professor of biomedical informatics and uh, pediatrics at Harvard Medical School, and I direct the computational health informatics program. If you'd like to uh, use social media, um, there's a hashtag recommended at Boss Chip is our program. Um, my um, uh, handle is at Mandel, and I don't think Michael has a Twitter handle, and if that um, tells you uh, how to win a Nobel Prize, that might just be one step in the right direction. Um, uh, and uh, we've introduced uh, now, we're gonna have the presentation, and I'll just remind folks um, that before we get to closing remarks and Q&A, you can put your questions in the Zoom box, uh, Q&A box as we go, um, and you don't have to wait till the end so that we're all ready to ask questions. So I'm going to stop sharing and turn it over to Michael Kramer. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, let me see if I can successfully bring up my slides and share them in the right format. Uh, screen one or screen two. Share that. Um, show you, um, this one. Yeah. Great. OK, wonderful. Um, I assume you can see my screen now? Perfectly. Perfect. Um, well, thank you so much for the introduction, and, and thanks, Ken, for inviting me. Um, as, uh, as Ken said, I'm, I'm now at the University of Chicago, but until recently, I was, uh, I was in the Harvard Economics Department and uh, lived in Brookline and, and uh, was a neighbor of Ken's. Uh, so, um, and uh, no, I'm, a, as Ken explained, I'm an economist. I, I specialize in the economics of low and middle income countries. And I've done a, a fair amount of research on water, um, initially on uh, social science, as, purely social science aspects. But over time, I've gotten to know uh, uh, some epidemiologists. And I would like to talk about uh, uh, three different papers today. But uh, the first paper is, it's still work in progress. It's co-authored with Steve Luby, who's an epidemiologist at Stanford, also with Ricardo Martins, who's now at Amazon, but used to be a, a postdoc at Harvard. Uh, Brandon Tan, um, who's, who's here today and will, um, will, will join in the presentation, I just finished a PhD at Harvard and is, is now in the IMF research department uh, working on, on health issues. Um, and what the paper is, is a meta-analysis of the impact of water treatment on child mortality. Um, as I noted, it's it's still work in progress. Uh, very much. I'm sorry, I accidentally went to the next slide. Uh, it's um, you know very much. Uh, so we're we're very much seeking feedback. Um, um, and I 
apologize if we're still using some terminology or following some economics uh, uh, norms. Um, we're we're trying to you know move that over to more of a, a biostats framework. So uh, you know, welcome feedback on on how to do that. Um, you know, substantively, we'll argue that the impact of water treatment on child survival may be quite large. Uh, I think larger than I think you know many people had had thought. Um, and beyond water, I think the paper shed some light on some limitations in the institutions that we've collectively set up for supporting and structuring research. And so we'll also share some comments that might be of broader interest on that. And then the latter two papers are joint with other social scientists and, um, uh, and, and focus more on social science questions, but still related to water. So the second paper is on pricing and targeting mechanisms for water treatment solution in, uh, in low and middle income countries. And you know, the, the finding, which I think is true for water treatment, but more generally, um, there's a finding in, that's come out from experimental approaches to economics, but also from behavioral science, suggesting that use of preventive health investments is typically very sensitive to cost, um, which suggests that uh, use of preventive health measures is much, much larger if it's free. Um, and you know, to some extent, that's traditional economics, uh, um, traditional supply and demand. But the magnitude of these is, is really of these effects is, is in some ways uh, it's very large, and suggests that um, behavioral factors may be at play. Now, one concern with free provision is that we might worry about waste, um, and in the case of of uh, dilute chlorine solution for water treatment. Uh, some people have expressed concern that if you give this away for free, some people might take it but not use it, and you might have some waste. And so this paper uh, that's joint with uh, Pascaline Dupas and Vivian Hoffman and Alex Wane um, discusses a mechanism to target water treatment to those who will use it. Um, and then the, the non-price mechanism. Uh, the third paper um, is goes even more deeply into using behavioral economics to try to increase use of water treatment beyond what would be expected just based on, on free delivery. And sort of combining the, the, the first set of results, the meta-analysis results with those from the second two, will argue that um, water treatment is a very cost-effective way of, of improving child survival. And, um, through there are multiple methods for delivery, but but at least two of the ones that I've I've studied uh, would be would be very cost effective. And uh, um, you know, I think people may have seen got some headlines earlier this week. Even though I'm not on Twitter, I heard about it um, that uh, the World Food Program asked Elon Musk for six billion dollars uh, and saying that they could. I don't know the details, but you know, address uh, global hunger uh, or, or solve world hunger. And Elon Musk said, if you could prove it, he'd donate six billion dollars. And um, you know, uh, I, I, these numbers are not solid, but a, a rough back of the envelope calculation based on our analysis suggests that a global program for water treatment costing about a billion dollars a year would save hundreds of thousands of children's lives each year. So, um, you know, whatever the specifics of, uh, of on, uh, on, on hunger, um, I do think this is an example of something that we often find in development economics that, you know, um, uh, expenditures that are uh, modest from a high income country perspective can have, so the right investments can have tremendous impacts. Okay. Um, just as a bit of background, um, let me say a little bit about some of the, the approaches for, um, for, uh, for uh, water treatment. So, um, you know, there's, uh, even before that, let me note that over 2 billion people uh, consume drinking water that's contaminated with fecal material every year. And there are many different treatment technologies, uh, you know, ranging from solar disinfection, reverse osmosis, simple filters, one of the you know, most common is using dilute chlorine solution. And, uh, um, and a lot of, our, of what I'll talk about today is that. Um, that's 
you know, very widespread for, you know, more than 100 years. Um, it's effective against most, but not all of the organisms that would cause diarrhea, which is a big killer in, in developing countries. It's very extremely inexpensive, and it's, it's uh, basically quite safe, although, um, you know, I'm sure people here could, could put some asterisks on that. Um, you know, it, we obviously get our water chlorinated through municipal systems, but there are other delivery systems where you know, there isn't municipal piped water. Um, I'll talk about this more later, but just as background, uh, there's point of, of use solution uh, on the left. Um, you know, that is, um, that there, there are organizations that sell that to households for very inexpensively. Um, I'll talk about a paper uh, involving coupons for free treatment. Um, and the, the middle approach is uh, dispensers full of dilute chlorine solution that are, that are pace, placed at a point where people collect water at a, a, a naturally occurring spring or a well. Um, and then on the right is a, a device for inline chlorination. If people are getting water through a pipe, you can, you can treat the water um, that, that's coming to them. So there are many different technological approaches. Um, the, you know, the first paper that we'd like to talk about is, uh, um, is a meta-analysis of 13 studies on the link between water quality interventions and child mortality. Um, and um, so um, let, me, uh, let, me, uh, let me start with, uh, let me start in with some background information and then Brandon will come in uh, partway through. Um, so, um, the, um, let me start talking about the existing evidence. So most of the existing evidence is not on child survival or child mortality, but it's actually on diarrhea and diarrhea as reported by caregivers. And there's a, a, quite a number of papers on this. Um, and there's a nice meta-analysis by Tom Clausen. And he finds, um, summarizing uh, inadequately, he finds a, a, almost a 40% reduction in caregiver reported child diarrhea. Now, um, there's also another set of evidence, which is quasi-experimental. Um, um, so these are what economists call natural experiments. For example, uh, Cutler and Miller have a paper on the introduction of water treatment in the United States. And they look city by city and look at, at what happens to, um, to mortality from various diseases. Um, and you know, there are a number of studies like this. Uh, Cutler and Miller, there's been some comments on that and some controversy about it, around it uh, recently. Um, but the um, findings of quite very large effects, sort of 25 to 50% reduction in all cause child mortality. But of course, this isn't experimental. Um, you know, there, there, there are issues with it, but uh, some of these studies I think are, are, are deserve the uh, title quasi-experimental. You know, they're, they're, they're carefully done. Now, on the other hand, um, you know, for many, uh, you know, many times uh, people want to see experimental evidence. And that's very, it's very difficult to get experimental evidence on child mortality. You need very large sample sizes. Um, um, even in, in low-income countries, child mortality is not that common anymore. Now, a large study means an expensive study. And because this you know, basic technology for treating water has been around for a very long time, there's limited commercial interest in supporting such big studies. Um, so most studies are not adequately powered. They're not big enough to get at, at mortality and they're powered for caregiver observed diarrhea. Um, and as a result of that, with just the evidence, the evidence of the impact on caregiver reports of, of diarrhea and the non-experimental evidence, um, you know, water treatment typically is not included in lists of evidence-backed child mortality interventions by WHO, World Bank, other, other international organizations. So it, it, it's, it doesn't receive you know, that much financial support. Now I do think, uh, let, me, let me actually hand it over to, to Brandon to, to pick it up here. Um, or uh, you're covering this slide, Brandon, or you want me to? Or I don't know whether this is the end or beginning of the slide that I was supposed to hand over. 
Yeah, this this is you. I'm okay. taking over after. <laughs> Thanks, Brendan. Um, uh, so, um, um, so I think there are indeed some reasons to be concerned with with the measure of of caregiver reported diarrhea. So I was involved in a, a paper ten years ago, um, where we were were actually um, we were surveying um, the impact of. Uh, Spring protection, uh, um, a, a technology to improve the source water source water quality. Um, on and we surveyed people infrequently, and then we got some referee comments saying you should survey people more frequently. So we tried doing that in a subsample, and so we had a subsample that was surveyed frequently, and another sample that was surveyed less frequently, and we saw. Reports of diarrhea went down 15 percentage points, and I think that's you know one hypothesis is that um, you know caregivers learned that if they answered their kid had diarrhea, they would get a whole series of follow-up questions of you know what exactly was the consistency of the diarrhea and was there blood in stool, and they didn't want those anymore. So, so perhaps some reporting bias, but you know even beyond that it looked like there was some effect of the measurement. So we were not studying chlorination at that time, but um, you could buy a chlorine solution in Kenya. It's available at, at shops. And we saw a big increase in positive chlorine tests. One of the nice things about studying water treatment is you can ask people for a sample of water in their, at their home, and then you can test that for chlorine. Um, and we saw, that, um, we saw that that went up. And that's, you know, both of those suggest that the act of surveying might affect reporting. So I personally think there's a lot of merit to these studies, but there are, there are legitimate reasons for caution. So Schmidt and Karncross uh, had an influential paper saying, you know, this caregiver reported diarrhea is not good enough as a measurement. And they called for two things, either blinded studies, that's not easy, the chlorine has a taste to it, uh, particularly if you're using it not through a carefully calibrated, uh, you know, uh, Boston uh, piped water system, but you're adding it yourself, um, and uh, or for measurement of objective outcomes. There's a very nice paper by Pickering and, and co-authors um, um, on that did blinded inline chlorination. Um, and they found the same effects of, uh, of you know, same order of magnitude effects on caregiver reported diarrhea. So I think that sort of ticks one of the things that uh, the skeptics asked for. This study is trying to address the other one. We're, and the basic idea is, even though these studies individually were not powered for, for mortality, they were just powered for diarrhea, much more common. By, the idea was, well, maybe if we combine all these studies, we'll be able to uh, get more power to detect impacts on, on mortality or possible impacts. And of course, the other thing is, you know, we care a lot about mortality as an, income, as an outcome. Uh, diarrhea is something we do care about, but we care more about mortality. Um, so now let me really turn it over to Brandon uh, to, to share some of, of the methodology and results. Great, um, thank you, Michael. Uh, next slide, please. Did I skip? Uh, there we go. That, is that the right slide? That's right. That's right. Thanks so much. Um, great. So now I'll be talking through some of the methods and results from a meta-analysis paper. So as Michael mentioned, there are many studies out there on water focused on studying intermediate outcomes, such as diarrhea or child development, because they are underpowered to study rare events, such as mortality. So what we did was that we conducted a large data collection exercise where we systematically identified all studies on water interventions. Typically, meta-analysis papers will simply extract an estimate from a paper, but we took it to the next level and contacted each author for data. This is because often mortality data wasn't even reported in the original publication, and sometimes the depth data was collected unintentionally by researchers, recording the reasons for attrition from the baseline. So we focused on studies that were first randomized control trials, second, had available data on mortality that they could share, Third, were done either in a low or middle income country. Fourth, were interventions on household water, either at home or at work. And finally had studies um, that had a valid control group. So two examples of this was that in one study, we found that a placebo water filter in the control group actually worked in reducing contamination. 
And another study where the control group was displaced geographically and received access to treated water. So after receiving this data, we extracted the relevant under five mortality counts by treatment and control group, which we then used for the analysis. Next slide, please. Great. So just to quickly go through our procedure, we reviewed all papers identified by two meta-analyses on the impact of water quality interventions on diarrhea, um, one by Klassen et al. and one by Wolf et al. And we extended the search to April 2020. And we systematically searched multiple databases, keywords, and contacted each author. Next slide, please. So here's a figure that takes us from the total number of studies identified to the 13 studies that we ended up including in our main specification for the meta-analysis. So first we started with 50, uh, 65 studies found, then we restricted to studies in low and middle income countries, taking us to 62. Then um, we restricted the RCTs, taking us to 52, then restricted additionally the studies, including children under, uh, under five, taking us to 51. Then what we did there is we reached out to the authors of these 51 studies, 10 of which didn't respond, um, 24 of which didn't collect mortality data, two of which collected data, but no longer was available, leaving us with 15 studies that we got data for. However, we exclude two of the 15 studies in the main specification due to uh, the invalid control group issue that I discussed earlier. But we do show that our results are robust, including them. Next slide, please. Great, so the 13 studies in our main specification have different intervention technologies. So 10 are water chlorination based, two are based on water filtration and one on spring protection. Um, and there's heterogeneity and variation in the study lengths, uh, baseline mortality and take up levels. So what we do is we use a random effects model to allow for these heterogeneous effects. Um, and just to quickly note, two of these studies are, um, uh, I'm, I'm involved in one of the studies and two uh, Michael is involved in, and six um, our co-author Steve Luby are involved in. So just uh, wanted to flag that, um, that a reason why we have a lot of studies in this paper is because we were involved in some of these trials. So one key challenge that we have to deal with in studying mortality is that because death is such a rare event, there are many cases in some studies where we have zero deaths in either the treatment or control group, making the relative risk or the odds ratio undefined. Next slide, please. So how do we deal with that challenge? So what we do is we use two methods, uh, one a frequentist approach and one a Bayesian approach. Our frequentist approach uses a pedo odds ratios framework which has been shown to be the least biased and most powerful method for studying low event rates, um, um, low event rate outcomes such as mortality. Second, we use a Bayesian logistic model where we directly model event rates in the control and treatment groups. So not just the odd ratios, and we use a weak uh, scene centered on zero as our prior. Next slide. Great. So before diving into the main results, we want to compare the conditions in our sample of studies to that of the developing world as a whole, to try to assess how externally valid our results are and whether our results can be applied to other low-income contexts. So we find that diarrhea prevalence levels in our sample of studies is similar to that in the developing world overall, covering a wide range in the distribution as shown in this figure. In fact, our settings, if anything, are slightly skewed towards the lower end of the diarrhea prevalence distribution. So we might expect even larger effects where risk levels are higher. Um, next slide, please. Great. Um, so here are our main results. So firstly, this is a force plot of our pedo odd specification. So for each study in, that we include, we plot the study's pedo odds ratio estimate on mortality split up by subgroups by chlorination, filtration, and spring protection interventions on this figure. Um, note really quickly that these est the estimates less than one imply a reduction in mortality. Overall, we estimate an average reduction in all-cause child mortality odds of 31.3%, which is one minus the 0 0.687 overall pedo odds meta-analysis estimate in red at the very bottom of this forest plot. And the effect is significant at the 95% confidence level, and we find a very similar 36% effect for the chlorination subgroup. Next slide, please. So our result of the Bayesian approach is almost identical. So here we plot the standard odd ratios for each study instead of the pedo odds ratios, 
And you notice that the, the odds ratios here for some studies are undefined because of zero events in the control group. So here we find an average reduction in all-cause mortality uh, for children under five of 32% in line with the pedo odds estimate. Next slide, please. Great. Um, so we also ran a bunch of sensitivity checks on our analysis to make sure that our results are robust. Um, we find that our results are similar when we take out any one study from the analysis, when we switch from an odds ratio framework to a risk difference one, or when we use a standard odds ratio frequentist approach, dropping to studies with zero events and undefined odds ratios. In some studies, there are multiple control groups. Typically, we pool them to improve power where appropriate, but we also show in the paper that our results are robust to these decisions. Last, when we include the two studies which had invalid or contaminated control groups, our results are also very similar. Next and finally, um, we also didn't find any evidence of publication bias using standard statistical tests following Beg and Egger, Egger et al. And we also used methods from a recent econometric paper by um, Andrews and Casey, uh, 2019, to correct and test for publication bias. And we find that our results are pretty much unchanged using those methods. At this point, I'll hand things back to Michael. Thanks so much, Brenda. Um, so uh, just to, you know, let me say a little bit more about the magnitude of the effects. So if we, if we take the Bayesian uh, meta-analysis estimate, uh, we get a reduction in the odds of all-cause child mortality by 32%. Let me, that's actually pretty similar to some of the quasi-experimental estimates based on historical, uh, uh, or including more recent history in Mexico, for example, or Argentina, um, uh, estimates. Um, but these effects, I wanted to note, these are much larger than would be implied if you, if you use the, very, the following very simple model. So if you took the estimates that are put out by the global burden of disease people um, on the total number of diarrheal deaths, and you just multiply that by, say, uh, the Clausen estimate of the per percentage reduction in diarrhea due to water treatment, you would get a much smaller number. Um, you know, um, you know. So take this uh, forty percent or thirty-nine percent reduction in, di in diarrhea. Multiply that by ten percent of deaths in these in these environments. You know, you get uh, being due to diarrhea. You'd get. You know, something more like four percent reduction in in all cause child mortality. So, um, you know, what to make of that? Um, you know, I think that's you know there there are multiple possibilities. Um, you know, um, let me list three, but then acknowledge a fourth. Um, you know, first, the global burden of disease estimates of diarrhea might be might be noisy. Uh, it's very hard to construct these. A lot of assumptions go into that. Um, and you know, the global burden of disease people acknowledge that. Um, the second is that diarrheal disease might increase the risk of mortality from other diseases. Uh, what's known as the mills reinke phenomenon. Um, so um, that could be respiratory infections. It could be diarrhea contributing to malnutrition. Um, there are other things that, that could happen among uh, um, there could be things involving childbirth, cleaner childbirth as well, that would affect things that, you know, very, for very young infants. Um, another possibility is that there could be a bigger, you know, just like COVID vaccines uh, are much more effective against severe COVID than against uh, just being, having a case of COVID, uh, could be that water treatment has a disproportionate impact on severe diarrhea. Uh, so those are three sort of broad categories. Uh, it's also possible, of course, that something is is wrong with uh, with our meta analysis. Uh, you know, meta analyses in general need caveats, and uh, certainly ours is no exception, and, and maybe needs some uh, additional uh, caveats. Um, um, so I'll come back to this a little bit later on when we think about cost effectiveness. Um, I would. You know, mostly I'm going to go back to water, but I did want to say something uh, about broader implications for meta-analyses and pre-analysis plans. I think um, I think this is an example where meta-analysis can improve power for learning about rare outcomes. None of these studies, well, 
the vast majority of these studies were not individually powered for mortality. Um, but by combining them, we can get more power. Now, let me note something about our institutions. I noted one thing about our institutions that's problematic, which is that you know, testing things that can't be, pat can't be patented or can't, um, are, there's not a commercial incentive to do that. So it's hard to get some of this testing done. Um, but another issue is a problem you know, within the research system, um, which is you know, there are re requirements out there to, to do pre-analysis plans. And people are supposed to you know, specify primary outcomes and secondary outcomes maybe. And people are reluctant to put down, too, researchers are reluctant to put down too many outcomes because then they may need to include procedures for multiple hypothesis testing. So if you think you don't have power for something, maybe you don't, you, you don't include it and then you don't report it or you don't collect it um, if you're not. And that, that, may, that creates a problem for doing the type of meta-analysis that we did. As Brandon shared, you know, we have a, a, a reasonable number of studies, but it's, it's on the low side. And you know, one might be, and we did some, some analysis on this, and, you know, pass some basic tests, um, although low power tests, um, suggesting that you know, we didn't see evidence for publication bias and we didn't see, and our, our sample does look pretty representative for the, for the world um, or for the low, low and middle income countries, but, but um, you know, maybe we're not as representative as, as would be ideal. So what would be a solution to this problem? Not just in our case of looking at water, but, or a potential solution, well, imagine that pre-analysis plans could pre-specify some outcomes for which the individual study is underpowered, but they could feed into a meta-analysis. I think that just that very simple step of allowing that to be pre-specified in a pre-analysis plan um, could contribute to our, our scientific understanding and to, to policy decisions. You could go further than that and you can have committees recommend collection of certain such outcome data. So obviously, if you went in and each study listed hundreds of outcomes, you know, then maybe you would have a, a further set problem of, of, uh, of multiple hypothesis testing at the meta-analysis stage. In our case, I would argue that mortality is a very, you know, is the first most natural outcome to look at, given that it's so important. Uh, uh, for well-being, and that it's very easy to collect uh, for the study participants. Um, so I think there, are, but there are probably many other contexts where rare outcome data could be collected, and and I think creating institutions to encourage that I think would be valuable. Um, okay. So let me let me switch to over uh, from the something that's on the, you know, has a, a big straight health com research component to move into things that are still health research, but are, are more firmly in social science. Um, so I'll, I'll discuss a, um, a paper on, on targeting health subsidies through a non-price mechanism. Uh, but first, let me give some, some background. So, you know, not very long ago in the, you know, as late as the 1990s, you know, many policymakers and in international institutions, not to, not to pick on Brandon's uh, new employer, uh, but the International Monetary Fund, for example, would, would advocate that the importance of user fees and on a variety of different grounds. But it wasn't just the evil IMF out there. You know, many NGOs advocated this as well, including an NGO that, that I was uh, involved in, in evaluating some of their projects. Now, in the case of, um, of you know, this sounds like the sort of, and you know, many economists did support this, but um, um, it's a little bit strange, even for, from a standard textbook economics point of view, in the case of communicable diseases, because you know, a standard sort of a principle taught in an introductory economics class is that of externalities. For communicable diseases, something that I do doesn't just protect myself, it pr protects other people. Again, COVID vaccination or mask wearing is a, is a case in point. And so there's an argument, a 
very standard uh, economic argument for subsidizing these activities. And that could potentially include water treatment, for example. But what I think, um, so in some ways this, um, you know, user fees might make sense for a lot of things, but for communicable diseases, it was, it was I think, always questionable from an econo a very orthodox economics uh, standpoint. But I think with the growth of, of two things, one, behavioral economics, so the bring, bringing ideas from psychology into economics, which has been a major, a major trend in economics over the past uh, 20 or more years. Um, and another aspect, which was using the experimental method more in economics. Um, together, those two things uh, led to a number of studies suggesting not just that people are sensitive to prices, but very, very large responses um, to, oh, that says fees or feces. I'm not referring to, maybe I have feces on my mind here, um, uh, to fees, that's supposed to say, for preventive health products. Um, and I'm saying preventive in, in deliberately. There's less price sensitivity uh, for, for treatment, uh, say for malaria treatment, for example. But for prevention, um, uh, or for um, or for treatment of chronic diseases, uh, there's a lot a lot more particular chronic diseases. Could come back to this in Q and A. There's a lot there's a lot of uh, price sensitivity. So a study I was involved in and um, on on treatment of intestinal hominids uh, found that which can be very cheaply treated. A forty cent fee for this um, reduced uh, usage from seventy percent to seventeen percent. Um, uh, a famous paper by Jessica Cohen, who's at, at the Harvard School of Public Health, and, and Pascaline Dupas found that uh, you know uh, found that uh, sixty cent price for mosquito nets. These things cost you know ten times that, uh, but even charging sixty cents reduced take up by sixty percentage points um, relative to to free use. And importantly. There was no sense in which one of the reasons why many people thought it was important to charge was there was a belief that if you don't charge for something, people won't value it, they won't use it, but they found no difference in usage rates between people who, who paid the full price for the mosquito nets and those who, who not sorry, not the full price, who paid this, paid this uh, actually highly subsidized price and people who got it for free. Now, applying this to water treatment, um, you know, the same basic finding holds there. So take up of the socially marketed uh, dilute chlorine solution is very low. So there's a, there are organizations that sell dilute chlorine solution in those small bottles I showed earlier. Um, they, they have, a, I think, are good organizations with a good distribution network. Uh, it was widely available in Kenya at the time, but still only 7% of people used it. And it cost, 20 or 30 cents for a month's supply. It's, it's pretty cheap, even by, even by Kenyan standards, um, and even lower in Malawi, which is, is significantly poorer than Kenya. Um, free provision um, substantially increased water treatment. I, I, you know, there's more people reached in Zambia. I, I don't want to, I don't want to claim that these programs are worthless, but they're not reaching as many people as we'd like. So free provision led to much higher, higher water treatment. Um, so here's a study I was involved with, in with uh, Pascaline Dupont, and, and uh, I'll, I'll show you the full author list in a minute. Um, some, some, people authored, uh, some people were offered a 50% discount on water treatment, others free delivery. After three to five months, uh, the household water was tested, uh, test for chlorine residual, 34% in the free delivery group, 12% when they had to uh, cost share. So they weren't paying even this full, low full price, but we're paying a, a fraction of that. So, um, you know, so this general principle holds, but it is somewhat difficult to get, um, you know, even when it's free, in this case, only 34% of people were using it. And that's, I think in part, because when you're administering the chlorine, so it takes a while for the taste of the chlorine to dissipate. I mean, imagine, you know, drinking swimming pool water or something. Um, um, and it takes, and if it, you over, over treat, it, it, you know, it, it's, uh, the, the taste is very noticeable. Some people don't like that. And of course the adults are probably have, you know, they probably got some immunity against the standard uh, organisms in the, in the water. Um, so, um, so 
you know, there's concern. Some people uh, have expressed concern about, you know, wasting, wasting the chlorine on people who aren't going to use it. I tend not to be super concerned about that anyway, because chlorine is so inexpensive. I mean, a bottle of bleach has got enough chlorine. I wouldn't recommend using bleach, but uh, um, it's it, because the, the, the concentration isn't controlled as well as you would want for water treatment, and among other reasons. But um, that's got enough chlorine in it for 70,000 liters of water. So it's, it's chlorine is very cheap. Um, but you know, if you are worried about the, the waste and you know, the packaging and delivery costs money as well. So you know, if, if two thirds of the people aren't using this to treat the water, then you know, maybe you would worry about that. So um, in this paper, um, we tried to explore are there other ways of targeting the water treatment? Um, and so obviously one group that, one way you'd want to target is to parents of young children, because it's young children who are also immunocompromised people, other people need, uh, need, uh, need safe water, but um, particularly young children are likely to die. So, um, so parents of children under six were recruited at maternal, maternal and child health clinics. And um, for those of you who don't work in, in global health, you know, there's been tremendous progress. Um, um, you know, more and more mothers, you know, most kids are getting immunized in developing countries, most, uh, you know, Mothers are coming in for antenatal care. There's more and more deliveries in clinics, et cetera. Um, so you can reach people there. And, um, and so one treatment group was offered coupons for free water treatment. So you know, there's limits on the extent you can just hand people a big bottle of chlorine and say, you know, take, you, know you can now chlorinate. One reason for that is, you know, why is chlorine, here's my by one attempt to be a, a scientist here. You know, chlorine is so effective against, uh, against so many organisms because it reacts with stuff. But because it reacts with stuff, if you have a bottle that's open and some dust gets in there, it's gonna react with that and, and it's not the dilute chlorine solution. It doesn't last forever. Um, and so, um, you know, if there's been some delay between manufacturing and getting to the clinic and then getting out to the mother, you don't wanna give a, here's five year supply of, of chlorine. Um, it's labeled as having an 18 month from manufacturing uh, shelf life. So, uh, but there might be other reasons to, to do this. Um, so this, uh, to do it in, in, in uh, not all at once. So we provided coupons that were redeemable either at the clinic or in some cases at local shops. Um, there were 12 vouchers, one per month. So calendar, people like putting up calendars on the walls of their houses. Um, so there were you know, vouchers for every month. They could redeem those. Another arm got free, free delivery of water treatment. Another got an opportunity to purchase the water treatment with 50% uh, discount. I, I put up some of the results before. Remember the free treatment got to 34% usage rates. Um, so we tested the water at the households for residual chlorine and, um, and we compared it across arms. What we found was that the coupon targeted water treatment very efficiently. So in, in the free delivery group, almost everyone took the, the, the water treatment solution. In the coupon group, only 40% of the vouchers were redeemed. But then when we compared, when we tested people's water, you know, we found it was almost identical. Um, so I mentioned 34% in the free delivery group, 33% in the coupon group. So in terms of screening, the coupon approach screened out 88% of those who would have otherwise used the chlorine, sorry, not used it, you know, taken the chlorine solution, but not used it to treat their water. But, you know, the point estimate, we can't reject zero, uh, you know, zero effect on, on, on the actual usage, but let's say, you know, our point estimate, you know, let's say about 3% um, uh, of those who would treat the water. So it's, it's a pretty good targeting device. Um, if you're concerned about, about wastage. Okay, so that's, um, that's um, now um, there's a further study that was done with Partners in Health, so another uh, uh, Harvard connection. Uh, Emily Rowe uh, was involved from, from Partners in Health. I'm not a co-author on this paper, but, uh, but uh, Pascaline did a further study in, in Malawi, um, and that was a larger study. Our study was pretty small. Um, 
and found in Malawi, this increased water treatment from 4% to 29%, pretty similar. Um, she actually found a bigger effect than free home delivery. Um, the, um, and because her sample was larger, she found some impacts on child illness. Um, I think consistent uh, broadly with the, um, with the, with the not our meta-analysis, which, which focused on mortality, but the, the previous meta-analysis on diarrhea. There's, I think this is something that is, is very promising from a policy standpoint, in part because this can easily be integrated into existing health systems. You know, a lot of mothers are already coming into clinics. There's already um, efforts to distribute free preventive health goods, in particular vaccination. Um, uh, many governments and many ministries of health have this, have, have good systems set up for this. Um, and if you do, integrated delivery of coupons for water treatment into this, um, I think that would be fairly natural in terms of the systems that have to be set up. I don't want to claim it's zero work. And it might actually, for some people, um, actually be added incentive to come back for additional immunization visits and so on. Uh, um, so, you know, trying to do some work to do very early stages, but to collaborate with governments to test and refine implementation of coupon systems. So we're working with the, the Ministry of Health in Kenya uh, to design a larger scale coupon program that would be integrated in with the Ministry of Health activities. And um, actually was just in, in Geneva and, and had some you know, super preliminary, but very encouraging conversations with people at the WHO about could this be integrated in with other maternal and child programs. Um, okay. Um, let me go on to uh, 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 the third paper that I wanted to discuss, and then I'll say conclude with a bit on cost effectiveness. Um, so um, the uh, you know mentioned that you're getting about one third uh, usage of chlorine, and that's that's better than four percent or seven percent, but still a long way off from where you would want to be. So the um, question was, could we do better? I think a, a key uh, result of, uh, from, from these studies was making it free goes a long way, but can we use behavioral economics to increase take up beyond just uh, making it free? So one of the, so we tried a variety of different approaches, but I think the one that was perhaps most promising, um, although I don't want to claim it can be used everywhere, um, is, dispensers with this water treatment solution. So if you think about that small bottle of, of uh, what's branded as water guard of dilute chlorine solution, you know, the cost of that small bottle, the plastic, you know, the packaging costs more than the dilute chlorine solution. Um, the, um, and if you think about using that, you know, you, you know, you go out to collect the water, you're bringing the kids with you, you're carrying you know, again, another piece of science that I can do to show off my, uh, my, you know, my, my knowledge. So apparently 20 liters of, of water uh, weighs, weighs uh, 20 kilograms. So, um, so that's pretty heavy. You know, that's a standard container size. So you get, you know, you've just carried that home from the, from the place where you're collecting water. Kids are, you know, kids are also carrying that. You know, there's other things to do. You can then add the, the water treatment solution, wait 20 minutes, but you know, you've got other things, you know, the kids are crying. It's very easy to think I'll, I'll deal with that later. Um, the dilute, this, is, this has the water treatment solution right at the point of water collection. So this could be, you know, depending on the area, uh, 10, 15 minutes or, or further from your house. When you're walking back, you know, the, with the, the, the the container of water on, on your head, um, and maybe another one, another container in your in your arm. Um, the um, you know that's being agitated, and time is passing, and that that reduces the taste and uh, increases the the effectiveness, and that um, and it's also um, it's all there's it's also there's provides. Uh, a particular time of day when you're going to do this, because you the natural time is when you're collecting water. If you think about, you know, we're not very in general. People aren't very good at at preventive health behavior, but at least uh, you know, 
if you think about brushing your teeth, you know, you get into a habit of doing it at a particular time each day, and then that, that makes it easier. And similarly, having a particular time when you've got to do the water treatment, when you're collecting the water, I think makes it easier as well. Um, the, um, it's also very salient. It's not like you have to go search for that bottle of water treatment solution. I mean, um, you've got, a, there's this big blue dispenser right at the water point. Um, it's pretty convenient. You don't have to measure it out into a cap. You just turn the knob, it releases the right dose. Um, and it's public. And because it's public, that I think is conducive. First, you can ask, you can ask other people what their experience was, but it also, I think, helps facilitate a formation of a social norm around use. So this got about 50% take up. Uh, it was sustained over time. So a lot of times, you know, you'll get a an increase in the short run from doing a push on 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 health behavior, but then that will fade over time. But this seemed to be sustained in our study for two years, but an NGO has adopted this, an NGO called Evidence Action has now had this in place for quite a while. Um, and they're reaching, they're reaching you know, double this number of people, but about 2 million people every day use it. In Kenya, Uganda, and Malawi. So very similar to the rates we got in the study. Um, by the way, a side comment. I think people often feel that, oh, we found some finding in a study, but of course, when you scale it up, it'll be smaller. I don't, I don't think that's always true for, if we're thinking about innovations like this one, um, because you don't get things right with the first innovation. You know, they've had a lot of time to optimize. You see a picture of somebody who's a local promoter, has a T-shirt, um, um, who's they've they've worked out systems for you know refilling this for promoting this et cetera. Um, so they're getting you know, in this case um, very similar rates uh, on, on a large scale. Um, okay, now these can't be used everywhere. I think one of the advantages of the coupon approach is it's quite broadly applicable. Here, um, there, it's only some places. For example, if people are, if everybody's getting water from a stream near their house, you can't put in a dispenser at every house. It would be too expensive. It's not that expensive, but uh, in a very low income country, it's not gonna be, uh, it can't be done everywhere. And the water needs, if the water is just too full of dirt, um, you know, it's not gonna work either. Um, and I don't think it's a coincidence that this has been scaled up by an NGO. Um, it requires infrastructure to be built and maintained. The dispensers have to be refilled. You know, and, and some governments would have no problem with that, but other governments might have problems uh, implementing that. With, um, let me also note that I don't think either of these technologies is the ultimate solution. I mean, we get our, our, our water through piped water systems and, uh, and, um, and um, you know, even if you don't have a full piped water system, even if the household's only getting, there, there's still times when the water comes through a pipe, even if there's no household connection, maybe it's to a stand pipe outside the house or serving a, you know, a, a block in an in a, in a urban setting, you know, peri-urban, a slum setting. Um, but then you can attach an automated inline chlorine doser. Um, and I think that has, has advantages and potentially you could treat everybody. And these, you know, the cost might be 35 or $40. So if you're serving a community, um, that's, that's not very expensive. And uh, Amy Pickering uh, um, has, a, has a paper suggesting uh, impacts on childhood diarrhea on this. Okay. Um, okay let, me, let me come back to the sort of policy and cost effectiveness question. Um, so if we take our meta-analysis data, and you know there are caveats to that, but I'm just trying to give some illustrative numbers. For dispensers, we have pretty good cost data at scale from the NGO that's doing this with millions of people. Um, as a benchmark, the World Health Organization has thresholds for what they call cost-effective uh, per year of life saved. Um, um, they call things cost-effective at three GDPs per capita, but they call things highly cost-effective at one GDP per capita. Um, the, so that would be $1,800 for Kenya. Um, 
the estimate, if you take our meta-analysis numbers, which obviously have some noise in them, the, um, the, and, and, um, and you know, maybe some biases as well, the estimated dispenser cost per year of life saved is $28. So incredibly cost-effective relative to um, you know, many, you know, on par with vaccines. Um, um, in fact, on par with the average cost, average cost of vaccines, not the marginal cost of, of extending vaccines, which is higher. Uh, the coupon program, this is much, much more speculative. Um, but, um, you know, we, I think that could be done at, at, you know, really very broadly in many contexts around the world. We don't have data from a large scale implementation, but some back of the envelope calculations, just the cost would be similar order of, of magnitude. Um, Here's some more detail. I'm going to skip over the detail, but um, uh, the cost effectiveness numbers are actually really very similar uh, between these two. Um, um, but so let me focus on, on not the difference between chlorine dispensers and global coupon program, where I, I, yeah, I don't basically all I can say is sort of same order of magnitude. Um, let me focus on you know, our meta analysis numbers are much bigger than the, what I'll call the multiplication approach. That's obviously very model dependent. I, I'm not, both of these, uh, I don't wanna claim that, you know, and, and uh, it excludes many, you know, I, I would tend more to put more, personally put a lot more weight on the meta-analysis. But, you know, let's say that you're somewhat model agnostic or you wanna do some model averaging and you take this multiplication approach. Well, it still looks really cost-effective there. You know, two hundred twenty-eight dollars per year of life saved when, you know, eighteen hundred would be highly cost-effective according to WHO standards. You know that 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 that's even if you use this much more conservative approach, um, it's going to be very cost-effective. So clearly, you know, whatever probability weights you want to put on the red columns versus the blue columns, um, this will be be very cost-effective. Um, and um, you know the. The WHO estimates 2 billion people around the world don't have access to safely managed drinking water services. Um, that is, um, and other estimates are, are similar. Um, that's not necessarily the exactly, you know, you could argue about these numbers, but if you take the meta-analysis estimate of, of the effect of, uh, uh, and you take the coupon usage rates, that would suggest that if you could, targeted that population, um, if you literally just, you know, uh, this is a you know, back of the envelope, but it would suggest, you know, half a million under five lives at a cost of just under a billion dollars a year. So uh, if we come back to, um, and, you know, as I say, you could, you know, I don't want to have, don't have perfect confidence in that number, but I'm quite confident it would be uh, hundreds of thousands of lives. So if a, a large philanthropist like Elon Musk has $6 billion to spare, you know, taking those numbers, uh, the, the point estimates literally, uh, a six-year water treatment program could save 3 million children's lives. So you know, we've been dealing with this COVID crisis as we, as we should have been. I guess what I would point out is um, you know, there are other communicable diseases that are, are creating immense uh, um, death tolls and that can be very easily addressed uh, using technologies we already have. And um, I think there is, is a lot of room for, um, for trying, for working on this. Um, so just to summarize, the meta-analysis suggests water treatment could substantially reduce child mortality and that it's likely very highly cost-effective. Uh, social science evidence suggests that free provision has a dramatic increase impact on usage that we can non we can quite effectively use non-price approaches such as coupons to target not only the people who are most vulnerable the um, uh, children but also the households that will, will actually use it and at least in some circumstances by using some ideas from behavioral economics or behavioral science more generally and using those to influence program design um, we can substantially further increase take up and I think in and um, I think more work is needed to figure out how we can move from um, either programs that have just been done on a small scale or on 
a, a modest, uh, you know, substantial but still modest scale, like the water, the dispensers, and think about how to incorporate those into government systems uh, that can be scaled more broadly. Thank you very much.